Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for this privilege that you've given us to gather around your word tonight to study more and to keep learning about what you tell us, and specifically tonight, what you tell us about your law. Please help us to see how you give it to us in love and you give it to us as a gift. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So before we get into anything new, I should ask, are there any questions from any of the stuff we've gone over the last time or the time before that at all? Hello, Pete. Welcome. Welcome. All right. So seeing no questions, we're actually jumping ahead tonight to chapter eight. I know Pastor Sharp likes to do all of chapter seven himself because that's usually the, the area in the book that gets some of the most questions um, out, of, out of the whole book. So he likes to be around for that to be able to answer those questions. And um, yeah, so we're in the chapter eight tonight. It's talking about the law. It's on page 41 in the binders, page 41. All right, so to start, God called the law a gift. And when we hear that, we might think to ourselves, how is the law a gift? You know, whenever we hear law, the connotation with that is kind of a scary thing. Um, you know, it's got punishment with it. How can a scary, punishing thing like that be considered a gift from God? Um, you know, chapter one, we talked about the natural versus the revealed law that comes from God. Um, and so what we're going to look at tonight is specifically the Ten Commandments, which are a summary of that whole revealed law from God that, that he tells us in his word. So the law has a couple uses that we're going to talk about first. There's three different uses. There's the curb, the mirror, and the guide. First of all, we get curb. That is means the law keeps us from doing bad stuff. Um, you know, on a, on a road, the road has curbs to keep you on the road, right? Sometimes people might drive up over the curb, jump the curb when they shouldn't be staying on the road, right? Sometimes with God's law, we jump the curb. You know, we, we don't follow God's law. We go off of his path. Um, that curb is there to keep us on God's path. And sometimes there might be consequences. And that's what the curb is. It's the consequences of, of going off of God's path. So that's the first use, curb. Second use, mirror. It shows us what we look like. You know, when you look in a mirror, you see an exact reflection. When we look at God's law, it shows a reflection of who we are by nature. It shows us our problem. Um, it says you're sinful. It says God tells you to be perfect. And when we see that, we, we, we see, well, I'm not perfect. I'm sinful, showing me my state. And the third use of the mirror that we have is our God. It shows us how to give thanks for Jesus saving us. So, so when we realize our state, when we have faith, now we want, and we say, God, I believe in you. I am appreciative that you forgive me. I want to serve you now. God has given us his law as a way to follow now to say, as a way to say thanks to God for that. All right, so we got a couple passages listed here, and we're going to start off with a little bit of a um, of categorizing them into one of those three uses. Are these uses, are these passages telling us the law as a guide, as a mirror, or as a curse? So we'll start with Romans 12, verse 1. So, Brianna, you want to read that one? Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your special act of worship. All right. So of those three, which do you think it is? Curb, mirror, or guide? I think it's a curb. You think it might be curb? All right, go ahead. Why do you think it's curb, Bridget? I mean, basically, he says, I urge you, um, brothers, to view of God's mercy, to offer your, your bodies as living sacrifices. So basically, um, he's saying, you know, just don't do this. Just do right. Be right. Be holy. It's pleasing to me. Of course, all of us, you know, none of us are because we was born to see him. But he's saying to do the best you can as far as being holy to him. And I think that's what he's saying is just keep us from doing bad stuff. So I think that's why it's a curb. Yeah, okay. So I definitely see what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's telling us what to do, right? It's telling us a good thing to do. And the opposite of that is doing the bad thing, which is what he doesn't want us to do, right? Um, but I think especially this passage, you know, it's not necessarily a punishment that's keeping us in check here. Um, what's What are we doing this in view of? It says in view of God's mercy. Um, when we see God's mercy, that's something we're thankful for, you know? It's not something we're scared of. Um, you know, if it said in view of God's wrath, be holy, um, yeah, that definitely be a curb because well, that's the punishment if I'm not going to be holy. But this passage is really getting at, you know, out of thankfulness for God's mercy, for God saving me. This is what you get to do now. This is how you get to live a holy life um, out of thanksgiving.
thanks to God. So yeah, this one's actually guide, guide for us. Once we see God's mercy, we say, now I want to live um, in a way that, that serves my God. All right. Thank you. You're and welcome. Second passage, <laughs> First John 3, verse 15. Peach, you want to read that one? Yeah. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. All right. Is it curbs giving us a threat, mirror showing us our sin, or God showing us how to live out of things now? I would say it's curb. Yeah, we definitely get some major curb in this one. Um, <laughs> no murderer has eternal life in him. Right. Yeah. That's a pretty scary threat, right? Yeah. To say that anyone who does this, you're not going to be in heaven is what it's saying. That, yeah, that's definitely something that's that's keeping us on God's path as a threat there. Um, yeah, and this one actually has two two of them in it. Um, we also get some mirror in the first half there. It says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. When I read that sentence, that's saying, Mark, you if you've ever hated someone, you're a murderer. I'm seeing my own sin in this, in this passage too. So I see myself in that. It shows me my sin, and it also curbs me to keep, to keep me from hating others because I, I see the threat that comes from doing that. All right, Psalm 119, verse 105. Ella Ann, you want to read that one? Uh, sure. All right. um, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. All right, curb, mirror, or guide, you guys think? Mm -hmm. Hello? She listened. So yeah, talking about path. Um, so yeah, you can kind of see as a curve. Yeah, what does God's word say? Um, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Well, if God's word is threatening me, then I'm going to stay on the path, right? Do you see another use in here too, maybe? It's a guide. Yeah, you see some guide too. Um, a light guides your path when it's dark outside, right? I was talking to Sabrina about where, where do I live? There's a house in the back of church property where I live. And so obviously when I come over, when it's dark like this, I take a flashlight with me so I don't, you know, trip and fall. I need a light to guide my path. So that flashlight guides me when I come to church. Same thing. God's word, it helps guide us as we're, we're walking through life now in, in a way that's pleasing to God. Yeah. All right. Psalm 119, verse 32. Bridget, go ahead and read that one. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. All right. Curb, is there a threat in there? Mirror, is it showing us our sin, or is it a guide showing us how to give thanks? thanks um yeah you set my heart free so i think it's a guy right yeah yeah you're right on the money bridge exactly you're focusing on a good part of this verse you set my heart free um like we said earlier at the start the law is a gift how is a scary thing like the law a gift well the writer of this psalm is saying your commands when i run in their path it sets me free god um He's saying, I love the law because it has freed me to do something else now. Um, think of it like if there is a house out on Highway 212 um, and there is a family with young kids that were living in it. They don't let the kids play in the front yard at all, at all because it's right by, you know, people are driving really fast on our road. It's dangerous. If a ball goes out there and the kid goes for it, they, there's a highly high chance they might get hurt. So they make them play in the backyard. But one day the mom and dad decide, you know what, we're going to build a fence in the front yard. So they build that front fence out there, and now they let their kids go play in the front yard because the fence is going to keep them in. You know, you're not saying that the fence is an evil thing there. It's it's a it's a freeing thing for the kids. They get to go into the front yard and play there now. Same thing with God's law. It's it's not something that we need to look at as constricting or or, or harmful to us. It's it's making us safe. It's giving us a free area to follow God's word. All right, last passage in this group. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Adrian, you want to read that one? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are filthy like rags. We are, we all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Thank you. All right, curb is there a threat and mirror? Is it showing me my sin or guide? Is it showing me how to live a life of thanks now? Which of those three? It's like mirror. Yeah, it's it's just it's talking about the state of, of all people. All of us have become unclean. 
Um, there's no one who does any good. It, all of our, even our best things are like filthy rags in God's sight. That's who I am. That's the law showing me this is who I am by, by nature here. Yeah, so great job on those. So those are the three uses of the law that we talk about sometimes. Um, and so in this section, in this chapter, we're going to see a lot of the mere use of the law. We're going to see go through the Ten Commandments that God tells us, and we're going to see a lot of times, how does this expose a sin that I'm guilty of? Of sometimes. And so it's going to be important as we're going through this. It can be a little bit of a depressing chapter because we just look at sin after sin that we do. But we need to remember after each one, Jesus kept this each of these laws perfectly for us so that we could be forgiven for them too. So I'll keep reminding us of that as we go through this, this chapter too. All right. So like I just said, the law that God has given to us is known as the Ten Commandments. Uh, he gave that law to Moses on two tablets of stone. Um, we don't know exactly um, which which laws were on which tablets. A lot of times when artists make renditions of this, it'll be like three on one stone, seven on the other stone. We'll talk about why that is, but we don't know exactly how God wrote these down. Um, we also don't even know which number each commandment should be. Um, the way we number them is not by divine inspiration from God. It's just the way that humans have decided to group these commandments together. Because God tells Moses when he's speaking to him, he says, I'm going to give you 10 sayings, 10 truths, these 10 commandments. And then God goes on to give 14 imperative verbs. And so we group them into 10 statements, and sometimes other churches do that in different ways. Um, the way that we use is a tradition that has been used by the Christian church um, from very early on in history up until this point. Um, and so once again, these Numbers are not divinely inspired by God. It's just the way that we've grouped them together to put them into Ten Commandments. Um, and so we refer to the Ten Commandments as being two tables. Um, talking about them as two tables, once again, is a teaching tool that humans have come up with to help remember how these laws, what, what these laws are given to us in two categories. Um, so the first table that we're going to look at consists of Commandments 1 through 3, and it deals with our relationship to God. Uh, the first table can be summarized by Matthew 22. I'll just read this one quickly. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. So the first three commandments, how am I in my relationship with God? The second table talks about the next, all the rest of the commandments, commandments 4 through 10. And that talks about our relationship with other people. And it's summarized by God's word just a few verses after that last passage you read. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. The laws in relationship with God and the laws in relationship with other people. And for the rest of this lesson, now we're going to walk through each one of those Ten Commandments. Um, we're going to see how it's a mirror pointing out our sin. And we're also going to read a section that says, what does this mean after each of those commandments? And so to give you guys context on where that's coming from, it's coming from the Catechism is what the book is called. So Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran Church, um, and back in the 1500s, he used to be a monk in the Catholic Church, but the more he studied God's word, the more he realized, okay, the Catholic Church is not teaching what God's word says. So in, to, to hold true to what God's word said, he broke off from them, and, and when he broke off, he, he was teaching other people what God's word really said, and he realized a lot of these other pastors in our local area don't have a good grasp on what God's word says. So he decided to make this catechism, which is a summary of of key teachings of the Ten Commandments, the sacraments that we've been looking at, um, the Lord's Prayer. And so Martin Luther wrote these what does this mean section to further explain what these commandments each mean. And, and the way he wrote these, he's pulling from all of Scripture, he's summarizing what all of Scripture says about these commandments. Um, and so we don't agree with Luther because he's divinely inspired, because he was just a person like any one of us. But we agree with Luther because he agrees with what Scripture so we have got some really nice explanations right. summarizing right. God's word very nicely here. So um, that is uh, what does this mean? All right. So we'll start with the first table of the law, our relationship with God. We get the very first commandment: "You shall have no other gods." What does this mean? We should fear love, and trust in God above all things. So God is to be number one in our lives. He has to be the top priority. So the first section there is not a verse, but a whole chapter, Daniel chapter 3. Um, some of you might know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they were three Israelite men 
when the Israelites got taken into captivity by a foreign enemy, Babylon, and they were working for the king there. But the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted all the subjects to bow down to this huge tower that he made up himself and worship him as a god. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, true believers in God, refused to do this. And they, they told him, Nebuchadnezzar, no, we're not going to bow down because you're, you know, you're not God. We, we believe in the true God. And that eventually led Nebuchadnezzar to throw those three men into a fiery furnace um, because they knew that they couldn't put anyone else above, above God. And thankfully, God worked a miracle for them. He saved them from that fiery furnace. But the point that we bring up, that I'm bringing up here, is that those men followed this this command. They didn't let anything else come before God. Um, Isaiah also says, "I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. God deserves all praise, all glory, because He is the true God. All everything else that people might worship, those are all false gods. They they are not real. Only God." is the true God. So you might be thinking to yourself right now, well, I don't have a little shrine at home to whatever God you're thinking of, but that's what the what does this mean come in, comes in. And there are subtle ways that we break this, this first commandment. Ephesians 5, verse 5. Sabrina, go ahead and read that one. <laughs> for, of, for of this you can be sure, and no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater as any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. All right. So in this in this book, Paul is writing to the congregation in Ephesus, and he's saying, if you're immoral, so that means if you put your flesh over God, if you just follow what your, your sinful nature wants, if you are greedy, a greedy person, if you're putting money above God, that makes you an idolater. That means you're putting something above God. Um, so yeah, it could be money. It could be yourself. Um, you can say whenever you sin, you're really putting your own desires over what God wants for you. Um, you know, another way this commandment gets broken, too, is if you have, like, excessive worry. If you're thinking, my life solely depends on what I can do to secure, make it secure. I have to make the most money I can. I have to have the best job, the, the best life. It all depends on me. That's another way this commandment's broken, because you're saying, I'm above God in the way I take care of my life, and we put ourselves above God in that way, too. So it's another way, you know, we can think about this is a way I might break this commandment sometimes. So just that bold statement there just summarizes everything about the first commandment. God wants us to love and trust him above all things, every single thing. All right, so that's the first commandment. Any questions, comments on that one? All right. So second commandment now. Second commandment says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not use his name to curse, swear, lie, or deceive, or use it superstitiously, but call upon God's name in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. All right, so we don't use God's name to curse. That means calling damnation on someone. You know, a very common phrase that people throw out nowadays is, you know, God be it. Um, that, that's what we're saying. That's not what you're supposed to do here. You don't use God's name to call curses like that onto someone. Um, you don't swear. Um, you know, a lot of times people just use very casually. They'll say, I swear to God, I didn't do this. So God says, don't use my name for flippant little things like that where it's not a serious oath. Um, are there times when we do use God's name in very serious oaths? Yeah. Um, you know, think about swearing in court. We, we swear in the Bible when we swear to tell the truth. Um, when you get married to someone, you make an oath before God saying, I promise I'm going to love this person um, as you love the church, God. Um, so that's, yeah, so that's what those two mean there. So God requires reverence for his name, respect for his name. We are only to use God's name in a positive sense. Um, we're not going to read every single one of the passages that are listed tonight just because there's a lot of passages in this chapter. So we'll hit kind of the highlight ones. Um, Leviticus 19, 12. Do you want to read that one, Peach? Yeah. Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane, profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Yeah, so God doesn't want us to use his name to lie either. Um, he doesn't want us to say, I swear to God that, da 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 to try to win a point argument if you're lying about it. That doesn't bring glory to God's name. Um, that that actually profanes God's name. It does, it, it does the exact opposite. Um, Matthew 5, verse 37, top of the next page. Ella Ann, go ahead and read that one. 
um of right. Simply let your yes be yes and your no no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Yeah. So this is from a chapter where Jesus is teaching. He tells the disciples, his disciples that are listening, you know, the, the Pharisees had really, the teachers of the law at Jesus' time had really twisted what it meant to take an oath. They said, you only have to follow your oath if you swear on certain things. And so they were making up all these random oaths that they didn't have to keep so that they could have loopholes, so that they could lie to people. And so Jesus, when he sees this, he tells his disciples, don't follow those teachers of the law. They're using God's name. They're using these oaths as a way to pretty much lie to people. Um, in your in your day-to-day -day life, just let your yes be yes and your no no. Just be an honest person. Don't come up with these elaborate oaths to, to trick people and to lie to them. Um, so, yeah, God does not deserve anything less than honor and reverence when it comes to his name. Cursing demeans that name, and mindless prayer falls into this category, too. So, it's not really giving God in his name the respect he deserves when we go to him in prayer and we're flipping about it. We don't really think about it. Um, we don't really think God is listening. Um, God, the fact that God tells us his name is a really special thing because that means God gives us that to be able to call him by name. Um, God didn't need to tell us what to call him. He didn't need to say, my name is Yahweh, the Savior, Messiah, God. He could have just let us think he's the great being and that would have been so much less personal than what we have that he tells us he's god he's our father and he tells us his name so that we can have that personal relationship with him so we want to respect that gift that god gives to us by using that that gift um the best we can all right third commandment then so this is the last commandment we have on the first table of the law talking about god's relationship with us and it is, remember the Sabbath day, Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching and his word, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. So Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath day already. Um, you know, we don't practice a normal Jewish Sabbath day like they used to saying. We can't do any work on, on for the Jewish people. It was Saturday. That was the Old Testament law. Um, you notice we don't do that because Jesus fulfilled that law. And the way Jesus taught about the Sabbath day and the way the rest of the New Testament talks about it, it really gets at the heart of this law. It's talking about giving respect and honor to God's word that we should. Um, so taking time to be in God's word to find the true rest that we get from God's word. So that's what that first point is talking about. Only the gospel gives true rest for the soul. Bridget, go ahead and read that passage from Matthew 11 right there. Yes, sir. And also, Adrian is with me, so she can read next. She said her phone went dead, so she logged right. out. Okay, right. okay. Right. So, Matthew 11, 28 through 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Thank you. Yeah, Jesus is talking in this section, and he's telling them, um, you know, come take my yoke upon you because Jesus' yoke is not really a yoke at all. When you put yourself under God's word, it gives us true rest, um, rest for our souls, rest that nothing else can give us. So we want to, to honor this commandment because it's something that's going to give us rest. Um, Pastor Sharp will say a lot of times whenever he's talking to someone about, you know, inviting them to come to church and they might say, oh, I just had a really busy week. I'm really tired. I just need, you know, Sunday's my one day off. I need that to rest. Pastor Sharp says he always replies to them, well, then exactly, this is the best place for rest. So yeah, come, come find rest here with God's word. Um, yeah, and so it's it's sometimes we need those reminders that, yeah, real rest does come from God's word. Um, it's important to be in church on a Sunday morning. That is where a Christian wants to be. Um, sometimes the question gets brought up here, why Sunday? Um, I said the, the Old Testament was that it had to be on Saturday. Um, but the reason why we have historically have had church services on Sunday is not because that's what God says now. We can worship whatever day we want. Um, you know, we had just this last Advent, we had the Wednesday evening services too. So you can pick any day of the week you want to worship on. But for the early Christian church, it was just a good day for them because, one, it helped distinguish them from the Jewish church to say, um, you guys rejected Jesus, but, you know, Jesus is God. And so we're going to separate ourselves at worshiping on a different day. Um, when Jesus rose, it happened on a Sunday, when Jesus appeared to the disciples um, 
the next time it was also on a Sunday. So just kind of set up a pattern where they thought, well, this is a really special day for us that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. So let's just celebrate, um, make that our day of worship, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, so yeah, so that's why we do it now historically. But like I said, it could be any day of the week that we wanted. Um, so Psalm 26, verse 8, we'll jump to that verse next. Adrian, go ahead and read that one. Psalms 26, 8. I love the house where you live, O oh Lord, the place where you where your glory dwells. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, the psalmist is saying, I love coming to your house, God. I love coming to where your presence is when I gather with other believers. So it's really about the attitude um, towards God's word, the, the love for God's word, the desire to be in God's word. Um, Colossians 3.16. Back to you, Sudan. Let the word of Christ Dwell in your retreat and we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Yeah, so, you know, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that's, and being taught, that's what we do in church on Sunday. And in and, and this passage, we're saying when God, when we do this, God wants us to do it with gratitude in our hearts, thankful that God gives us this gift of rest around his word. Um, that we can come and join in on that. And so, yeah, the word of God is described as food for the soul, too. It, it helps feed us. It keeps us strong in our faith. Hebrews 10, 25. Go ahead, Coach. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Yeah. So when the writer of the Hebrews wrote his book, there were some people that he was writing to that stopped gathering together with other believers. And he encourages them to encourage others to come back. You know, keep meeting together as we're waiting for Jesus to return. Keep feeding your soul. Keep finding rest in God's word. Um, so same thing with us today. We don't want to give up going to church. Um, and when we see other believers who sometimes fall out of that pattern, out of that habit, we encourage them, um, you know, come back to God's rest. Come back to God's word. It's going to feed your soul. It's going to it's gonna build you up in a way that nothing else can. Um Pastor Sharp uses a saying here that I, I haven't heard before, but maybe some of you have had it. Um, it goes, if, oh, let me, let me look by down. I don't want to mess it up. Okay, yeah. So being in an airport doesn't make you a plane, but if you're a plane, you're going to find yourself in an airport. And he's, he's changed out the words to describe a Christian. Um, if being in church doesn't make you a Christian, but if you're a Christian, you're going to find yourself in church. So, you know, when you believe in God's word, when you study God's word, just naturally, it's going to move you to, to want to gather together with others around his word, um, to come to church, be with other believers, be fed by his word. All right. And with that, that is the first table of the law. So those are all the commandments dealing with our relationship with God. Any thoughts or questions on any of those three commandments? All right. Not seeing any, we'll hop to the second table of the law now. So turning our focus now to our relationship with other people and what God commands us about, about those relationships. And so we start with the fourth commandment. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not dishonor or anger our parents and others in authority, but honor, serve, and obey them and give them love and respect. Um, this commandment, unique from the other ones, it's Martin Luther also wrote a different place that it's the first commandment with a promise. We get that promise that, you know, when you honor your father and mother, you get enjoy long life on the earth. That's a cool promise to attach to this um, commandment. And, and when Luther starts his explanation, he says we should fear and love God. Um, those words right there are telling us why we do it, not just for this commandment, but for all the commandments. Why we want to follow those? Well, we fear God, meaning we have, you know, holy respect for God. We believe in him and we love God. We love what he does for us. So we want to follow his commandments back for him too. All right. So we are to honor our parents and others that God has placed over us. Um, you know, Proverbs 30, 17 is, is pretty much just saying, you know, don't mock your father. Don't mock, mock your parents. Um, listen to them. Obey them. Be respectful to them. Colossians 3, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Um, notice the passage doesn't say obey your parents because they're always right, but because they represent God, because this is something that pleases God. Um, because parents aren't perfect. And there will be times they make mistakes and, 
And, and this passage is encouraging children to be, you know, say, I understand my parents will make mistakes, but God has still placed them over me for a reason. So because God has done that, I want to respect them and show them honor. All right, Acts 5, verse 29. Elohim, go ahead and read that passage for us, please. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. All right, thank you. So in the very early Christian church, Peter and John and the other disciples were preaching God's word, what Jesus had taught them faithfully. And as they were doing that, the teachers of the law who had rejected Jesus arrest them, and they, they, they bring them on trial before them, and they tell them to stop talking about Jesus. Stop talking about what Jesus did, how he died and rose again. Um, but this is what Peter replies to them. He tells them, you know, I can't stop because I must obey God rather than men. So this brings up one exception to this commandment. Um, if your parents or someone in authority tells you to do what's against God's will, God is God is always, you know, over the top of that. God is the trump to your parents or to authority. Um, we always want to do what God says first, even if that means going against what someone in authority might tell us. We are also to obey the government that God has placed over us. So this isn't just talking about, you know, your, your mom and dad, your blood relatives, but this is really is applied to all people in authority, whatever that might look like. Um, you know, for some nations, that's a king. For our nation, it's the, the government we have with the president, the House of Representatives. Um, those people are all in authority over us. And I'll read this First Peter 2, verse 18 passage here. Um, Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Um, so when we read the word slaves in our context now, our first thought probably jumps to all of the abuses that have happened in our nation's history um, with that led to the Civil War and all those awful things that happened. Um, God is not saying, I condone that. That is definitely a sin when we take all of God's word into account. People were, were hurt, misused, abused in ways that should never happen to a person. Um, but in the context of, the, of the, when the Bible was written, slavery was often practiced as more of like a, a, a loving job, almost. You know, we get Abraham, we hear about his example. He had slaves in his household um, that worked for him, but he was an awesome master. He loved them. He treated them as his own family, um, the Bible tells us. Um, so yeah, there's definitely ways that this was, was used, that slavery was used in a loving way, in the right way, almost like an employer-employee relationship. So when we read this verse, you can almost switch out those words to say, um, you know, employees, submit yourselves to your employers with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Um, so yeah, even in your work that you do, even with the government, when there's someone in authority, that God has placed them there for a reason. Um, I think it's important to note, too, that a lot of people would hear this today and say, oh, well, our government is just so bad, I can't possibly respect them. Well, when Peter and Paul wrote about um, respecting the government, they had a government that wanted to kill Christians. And so even then, God was encouraging them, still obey them, because I put them there for a reason. Um, so I think that's important for us number two nowadays, that even if the government doesn't necessarily do things we agree with all the time, they're still God's representative for our benefit. All right, so any questions on that commandment? I know that can bring up some, some thoughts sometimes. All right, jump to the fifth commandment then. Keep rolling. The fifth commandment says, you shall not murder. So this one is talking about respecting and honoring God's gift of life. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and be a friend to him in every bodily need. So there is a distinction between killing and murdering. When the Bible, excuse me, uses the word murder, um, well, yeah, I should start by saying the Bible has different words to describe these things that, that implies different things about killing. So the word that's used with murder is implying an unjust killing, something that's not right. Um, so we get, you know, God talks about why we honor this gift in Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made man. Um, God created mankind as a special creature, so when we decide to take God's place and when we decide to take someone's life, that's dishonoring the gift that God has given of human life. And so you'll see those italic words right there. Only God has the right to determine when a person's time of grace should be ended. 
So that, that phrase, time of grace, that's referring to a person's lifetime. Um, the person's whole amount of time on earth that they have to come to know God. Um, so what we're saying is only God should is the one who should end that, not us. Um, because God has a plan for everyone. We don't want to you know, force ourselves under God's plan and say we know better. So revenge also does not belong to us, but to God. And this is a tough one to think sometimes because we'll often be tempted to think that I have the right um, to hear revenge on someone. But we need to remember that's God's job. Um, Romans 13, verse 4. I think we're up to you, Bridget, if you want to read that one. Romans 13, verse 4. Okay, yes, sir. Um, let's see. For he, government, is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant and agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Thank you. Yeah. So this is talking about government. This is one way God carries out his punishment here on earth right now. Um, it's talking about the government bears the sword. That's talking about the right to, to end lies. Um, in the government that we have, we can vote if we want our government to use that ability or not. Um, to, but just because we vote on it doesn't mean our government doesn't have the ability. It means it does. We're just making a decision. Do we want to use that gift or not? So as God's representatives, the government can choose to do that. We also see that human life is a trust from God. Suicide is a sin. Um, when someone takes their own life, they're, they're saying to God, I know what's best for my life not you, God. So I'm going to make the decision that I think is better than your decision, God. Um, they, they take away that gift of life that God has given to them before God determines to in his plan. Um, sometimes the question that comes up, um, I should have said this with the government point, um, people wonder, do soldiers commit murder? And the answer to that one is is no, they don't, they don't murder. It's not an unjust killing. They're working for the government, which is God's representative. They're working to protect us, to, to, to serve in that way. And so when they fight wars, when they when they kill other people, they're doing it as God's represent as God's representative to protect us, not out of an unjust way. Can a soldier murder? Yeah. If a soldier were to go over, um, let's say Iraq, in Iraq somewhere in a village, and just, just go start randomly killing women and children, that's obviously murdering. That's that's not doing something to protect. That is just unjust, heartless murder. Um, but fighting in a war does not necessarily mean they're murdering people. All right, our next point is this one, abortion. So the question with that is, when does life begin? And we get Psalm 51, verse 5. Adrian, go ahead and read that verse for us, please. Yeah. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. All right. So this verse is saying, not only from birth was I sinful, but from the very moment of conception. Um, that's saying from the moment you're conceived, you had life. You were tainted with sin, even from that moment. Um, so once again, it's not up to us to decide when to end um, a, a baby's life, even if it's just um, it's still in the mother's womb. Um, it's not our choice when to end that. That's, that's still God's choice. Um, when it comes to abortion, too, it's not always black and white. It's not always... I'm just doing this for my own, my own, um, not pleasure, but convenience. Um, sometimes there are, there are times when there are complications to pregnancy, and it's it comes down to all right, it's either save the mother's life or save the baby's life. Um, and you know, God's word doesn't always speak on things like that. Um, what we need to remember in situations like that is what's the motivation? Is it is it thinking I want to respect God's gift of life the best way I can to save a life? Or is it a selfish motivation saying it would be less convenient for me to have this child now just because I don't want a child right now? So obviously, each situation, you take that one situation at a time and try to apply God's word the best way you can to, to it. Um, yeah. And finally, for, for the fifth commandment, the person who hates has already committed murder in the heart. 1 John 3.15. Go ahead, Sabrina. <clears throat> Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Yeah, so we read this one earlier, another another mirror pass, passage right here, right? Mm -hmm. Pointing back at us. Um, even hatred is considered murder in God's in God's eyes, um, murder in the heart. So we want to remember that. Um, it's not okay to hate someone or to get angry at someone. Um, it's equated with murdering. It's a, it's a way we break this commandment very often. 
This also doesn't mean you have to be everyone's best buddy, though. Um, there are times when people do things that, you know, that sometimes you might get angry at, and for sometimes good reason. Um, that doesn't mean you have to be their buddy, hanging out with them all the time. You can separate yourself from people like that, but once again, it comes to what is what is moving you to do that in your heart. Are you thinking, well, I really want to hurt this person by not being their friend? Okay, that's not a, a, a loving thing to do. Um, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I know that this is a situation I get put in where I am being led to break this commandment. I just know that I need to be separate from this person to, to not put myself in that situation. I'm not trying to hurt them, but just realizing this is what's going to best help me walk in my life with God. Well, then, yeah, that's that's okay to do that for sure. All right, so a lot of points there with the fifth commandment. Um, any thoughts, questions on fifth commandment? All right. So we're halfway through, and now I'll take this time to remind us that We've looked at a lot of things that have really pointed out a lot of ways that I've broken God's will. I've, I've, I've dishonored other people in authority. I've hated people before. But remember with all of these, for each one of these commandments, Jesus was the one who came to earth. He followed every single one of these perfectly to give us that record of righteousness for all the time to be broken. Um, and so now we don't need to look at those five laws we've just gone through as um, just mere ways now. We get to look at them as things that I get to do now to show God thanks. Um, I get to to love and honor those who are above me as God's gift to show thanks to God now too. All right. So let's keep rolling. Get through as many of these we can. Um, sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Um, so this is talking about misuse of God's gift of sex and marriage. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we, we lead a pure and decent life in words and actions and that husband and wife love and honor each other. So God was the one who instituted marriage and gave the, that gift to mankind, and he wants to protect that gift that he gives. Um, so God is calling for purity and living in thought, word, and deed. Um, so it's not just saying don't go live a you know promiscuous life, don't go sleep around. Even in the things you say, even in the thoughts you have, um, don't break this commandment. So we'll read Ephesians 5, verse 3 and 4. Um, Sabrina, are we back to you, I think? No. Okay. Oh, I didn't use the last. Okay. Ephesians, Go ahead. Oh, Ephesians 5, 3, 4. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be, nor should be there, there be um, vicinity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Yeah, so God's word says not even a hint of this stuff. Um, not even a little bit is okay for God's people. Um, you know, obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking. So that's saying anything that's taking God's gift of marriage or of sex and, and taking it lightly, making jokes about it. Um, you know, a lot of times, a lot of comedy nowadays is, is sexually focused because people think it's funny. Um, God's telling us not even that. You know, don't, don't have anything to do with that. And God tells us that for a good reason. The more that you joke about these things or talk about them loosely, um, the, the more dull your conscience becomes to them. You think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And it becomes easier to talk about them, to joke about them, easier to, to turn that into your lifestyle and to start acting on those things instead of just talking on those things. So God's telling us here, don't even get started with it at all. Uh, in Matthew 5, verse 28, I'll read this one quick. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Um, so yeah, once again, all these commandments really attack what's going on on the inside before even what the action the result. Um, even looking at someone, thinking about them sexually like that, that's breaking this commandment too. Um, and God starts right there at the root of the problem. All right, that is the sixth commandment. Seventh commandment, <clears throat> you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not take our neighbor's money or property or get it by dishonest dealing, but help him to improve and protect his property and business. And the passage right there, the first one, Psalm 24, is just a reminder that all things here on earth are God's. Um, yeah, this is my laptop. This is my water bottle. But who do they really belong to? They're all from God. And he's just letting me use those things. So I want to make sure to take care of that gift of those possessions. Um, so that includes unfair or deceptive business practices. Leviticus 19.11. Ella Ann, go ahead and read that one, please. 
Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. All right. So do not steal. Starts with the most explicit way to say that. Don't take other people's things. But we also get this passage equated to stealing. Don't deceive one another. You know, it's really saying don't be sneaky about taking someone's stuff. Um, you know, think about all the ways things like that get taken now. Um, phishing scams through emails that people will try to send out to do that. Um, you know, back in, in, in God's, in this time when this was written, some market um, owners would use dishonest scales. So it'd be saying this is what you're really paying for, but they purposely put more on there so that they could charge more for those things. You know, pretty much lying to get more money from these people. So even tricking people into giving you more, that's breaking the scam too. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. Bridget, go ahead and read that one for us. Hey, we're um, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he should not eat. Thank you. Yeah, so Paul was encouraging the believers in this letter saying, you know, don't be lazy. If you have the ability to work, work for what you have to, to earn, um, you know, to, to get these things. Um, not using your abilities and, and not working for them is a, is a form of stealing, really. Um, because you're making someone else provide for you when you should really be able to provide for yourself. Um, you're taking advantage of someone, making taking advantage of their hard work instead of using your own hard work that you could do. Um, of course, are there times when people can't work for themselves? Yeah, there are. And that's a time when you should be helping them and, and using your possessions to help them. But when people should be working and aren't working, they're taking time and possessions away from people who really need it. Um, and stealing away from them. All right, there are three ways mentioned to obtain something. The Bible. This is a summary of the three ways the Bible talks about how you get possessions. Number one, you receive it as a gift. So talking about like inheritance, when someone gives you something. Number two, you might just find it somewhere. Or number three, you work for it. And that is the most um, most talked about, most common way you come across things is when when you just work for it. So we need to remember with this commandment, we are stewards or managers of the gifts that God has, has given to us. Um, in that Ephesians 8, 4 passage just reminds us, you know, if someone's stealing, tell them not to steal, but to be useful with their own hands, um, to share with what they have in need. So God's saying, the reason you work isn't so you can build up just a, a huge amount of wealth. You work so that you can use God's possessions and give it back to people who need it, to share with other people. Um, so we want to take care of our own things. We want to help people take care of their things, too, because God has blessed them with those things. All right, eighth man, I think we're going to get through all ten of them. So there we go. Eighth man, you shall not give false testimony about your neighbor, um, so pretty much protecting your neighbor's name. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, or give him a bad name, but defend him, speak well of him, and take his words and actions in the kindest possible way. Um, especially that last part is very easy to break in the in, in today's world. Um, you know, you think with the internet, it really shows where people's hearts are at. Um, people just tearing down other people's actions and choices all the time with the internet, um, jumping to the worst conclusion possible as fast as we can. Um, God says not to do that. You know, you know, take these things in the best light that you can. Proverbs 19, verse 5, Adrian, go ahead and read that one. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who pours out lies will not go free. So the writer of that proverb is saying, God will punish people who pour out lies against others, who, who gossip about others, make up these things. Um, yeah, it's, it's a serious thing that we need to address. Um, God asks us to always speak highly of other people and to take things in the best way possible. Um, I think with American culture, too, so much news is based around gossiping about other people, gossiping about celebrities, athletes, politicians. Um, you know, it's it's almost become normal to gossip. It's it's just like a, a fun pastime to do. And the devil is really tricky trying to get us to 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 not think about how this is a way that we break God's commandments sometimes. It's a good reminder for us. All right, so to finish off, we take the ninth and tenth commandments and we take those together um, because it's saying the same thing but just focused on different objects. Both of them have to do with coveting. So I'll read both of them first. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. 
What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or obtain it by false claims, but do all we can to help them keep it. And the tenth, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his workers or his animals or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not force or entice away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, but urge them to stay and do their duty. All right, so coveting. Coveting means that you want something that's not yours. Um, the opposite of coveting is content, being happy with what you have, with what God has given to you. Um, and so there are many evil effects of coveting. It can lead to a lot of other problems. First Timothy 6, verse 8 through 10. Go ahead, Sabrina. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have warded from, from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Thank you. So that passage you know, in verse 10, that is a very popular passage that gets misquoted a lot of times. Um, a lot of people will say money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's not what Paul wrote here. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Um, you know, it, it leads you to do things that that destroy your life to get money. Think about the, the, the family who the dad wants more money, he gets promotion, that takes up more of his time to be working for that money, to be gaining that money because he loves that. Can destroy your family just by trying to get more money. Um, I think a really good Bible story that demonstrates this is David and Bathsheba. So King David was walking on the palace, on the roof of his palace one night when he sees this woman, Bathsheba, uh, bathing on her house. Um, it was normal for women to do that at that time, so it wasn't like she wasn't trying to like show off or anything. But David looked when he should not have been looking. He shouldn't even have been up on his palace putting himself in that position. David sees her. He wants her to be his wife. So he sends a messenger, has her brought in. Um, they sleep together, and then she becomes pregnant. And so David's thinking, okay, I got to play this off. I'm in trouble now. He calls back her husband from the front lines of the war that he's fighting in and tries to get him to go to go home and sleep with his wife so that he can lie about it. Her husband, being a good guy, refuses, saying, I know I should be back out on the battlefield where all my brothers are at right now. So he doesn't do it. And so David says, well, I got to get rid of him now. So he gives the commander of the army the instruction to put him on the front line so that he can get killed. And that's what happens. So all of those sins that David did, it all started with, with seeing Bathsheba and coveting her, wanting her to be his own wife. And it led to lying, to, to breaking the sixth commandment, committing adultery with her, to murdering her husband. Um, so you see, wanting something like that, coveting something, can easily lead to one sin after the other, just to get that thing that you want. So yeah, it's a very slippery slope that we need to be careful of too. Once again, showing us to be what's on the inside that matters, that thought of coveting. Um, God says that is a sin too. Um, so we need to be content with what God has given us. After all, remember that the words of Jesus, what, a, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So just a reminder that we could want everything we have on the earth, but none of that's going to give us eternal life. God gives us what we, we, we really need with, with salvation and God's word. And everything else God gives us is just the cherry on top of that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> all right. So now we get to the conclusion of all of these Ten Commandments. Um, we walked through the Ten Commandments. We've broken every single one of them. Um, there's been times when we haven't honored people in authority. There's been times when we hated, times when we've coveted things. Um, every one of these commandments, we've broken them. And we, we're going to review so those three purposes that God has given his law, curb, her, her, mirror, and God. Yeah. And mirror is the one that's highlighted here because that's the one that is most often used with the law. Um, it, it leads us to see our sins. It leads us to recognize our need for a Savior. So we look at these laws and we see, wow, I'm a sinner. I really need someone to help. Um, Romans 3.20, this is just a reminder too. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Um, that was a big verse in chapter 2 with the law. God doesn't give us these so that we can make ourselves perfect. He gives us them to see our sin, to look in that mirror and to say, I need a Savior. So God demands perfection. We cannot do it. These are all mirror passages that we have right here. Um, I won't read any of them specifically. You can just skim through those and see them. Um, you know, be perfect. 
well, I'm not perfect. Um, the wages of sin is death. I'm sinful. That means my what I deserve is death, too. Every one of my acts is like a filthy rag. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. That means me. I have fallen short of what God demands from me. So not a single person is justified by the law. Galatians 3.11, clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. So our life comes through faith. It doesn't come from keeping the, these laws perfectly or anything. It's only by what God has done to, to save us, what Jesus has done, as we, you know, we talked about that earlier in these chapters. Um, and so when we keep the laws, we can rejoice in them. We can be glad that we get to keep them now, that we have faith. Um, that faith is what makes us able to follow these men. And so, yeah, there's only one way to be saved. Um, Galatians, or I'll do the Second Corinthians passage there. It's, it's the great exchange once again. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God took on all those times he broken these commandments. He took that punishment for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So because Jesus lived his perfect life because he kept every one of those commandments, he gives us that perfect record um, so that God sees us and he sees Jesus' life instead. All right, that takes us just up to eight o'clock. So made it through the whole chapter, That's which is awesome. Sometimes this one takes a little bit longer. So any questions before we, we head out for the night? I have one question. What is the name of the book that you guys was using for Martin Luther King? Yeah, so it's it's actually Martin Luther. That's a very, very common mix up. Yeah, so Martin Luther um, lived in the 1500s. He was the one that started our, our church body when he broke off from the Catholic Church. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, um, yeah, those mix, those mix up a lot. So, and, but Mar yeah, Martin Luther's book that he wrote is called the Catechism. Um, the Catechism. Can you spell it? For yes, it's C A T C. Wait, no, I'm messing up. Okay, C A T E C H I S M. Okay, thank you so much. And I didn't mean Martin Luther King. My apologies, but thank you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it might be ISIN at the end. I, Sabrina's correcting me right now, but I think you'll get up one of those two ways. It'll get there. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah you know, Martin Luther's Catechism. Yeah, it should come up on on Google or whatever. And Bridget, I know we also have copies here at church too um, that people could look at. So if you're interested in looking into that more, um, we got some on the library shelf too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's close then tonight with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us your law again tonight. Thank you for showing us how it's, it, it can be a wonderful gift from you. Um, you show us our sin with these commandments, but we are reminded Jesus kept every one of them for us. Help us now through faith to live joyfully keeping these commandments, to give you thanks for that gift of salvation. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.